I get the honor of introducing my colleague, Philip Jenkins. Um, Philip is actually the one that came up with the idea for this conference. Philip does that all the time. He comes up with his anniversary, so you're having a difficulty hearing me. I'm not sure how to turn the volume up on this thing, but um, speak just speak a little bit louder. Yeah. So um, there's much I could say about Philip Jenkins. Uh, he knows anniversaries very well. So you're. You're here because of the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide, but Philip has an anniversary for everything and thinks we should celebrate all of those anniversaries uh, with meetings like this, and this one is really worthwhile. Uh, Philip is a distinguished professor in the history department, in addition to being at ISR. Um, Philip writes prolifically on many different subjects. Uh, some of you know of him because of his work on uh, uh, global Christianity. Others of you know of him for his work on terrorism. Some of you know of his work on serial murderers, and others of you know on his work on any number of topics. I think he has a new book coming out on poetry uh, next year. But um, Philip never met a subject he didn't like or wasn't an authority in. But uh, Philip is a, a great friend, um, and you're going to hear from him in just a second. I'm going to be in and out, so I won't have a chance to say this, but we're thrilled to have Tom Farr here. Um, uh, a, a friend and colleague, we uh, share together a project called the Religious Freedom Project at Georgetown University, and uh, we've been partnering together now for almost two years. It's a wonderful partnership <coughs> with all kinds of projects going on, so we're really delighted to have Tom here, and he'll be introduced momentarily. And I have to also recognize some other people that are with us today. We have uh, Alice Starr uh, sitting with Frank and Carolyn Wolf. Um, and there, back here, you can see them. Frank Wolf, after 34 years in Congress, retired recently and has been hired uh, to fill the Wilson Chair on Religious Freedom here at Baylor. And so uh, the congressman is doing all kinds of things. He's already taught a class today. He'll be with Ken Starr tomorrow night for On Topic, and then he has other events this week, too. So we're delighted to have him. So without further ado, let me introduce Philip Jenkins. Thank you very much, and uh, please tell me if you have any uh, difficulty uh, hearing. You sometimes get kind of strange uh, uh, acoustics in this room. Uh, we are here to uh, commemorate the, uh, the Armenian Genocide. What I want to do uh, is to talk about the circumstances that led to that genocide and to see how far we can use our understandings of that event to understand other events of massacre, of religious persecution uh, around the world, and to learn what to do in such circumstances, and maybe even more important, what not to do, because there are some kind of horrible warnings in the, um, in the story. Um, we're familiar with the basic idea. In 1915, the Ottoman Turkish government made the decision to uh, basically exterminate, to destroy its religious minorities. What did not happen was they did not decide to do that on a, a random basis. They did not decide to do it because they were Muslims and they hated Christians. It's a much more uh, complex story. And uh, it, it also makes very little sense unless you look at a series of other events that had happened over the previous 50 or 60 years. Repeatedly over that period, there had been episodes of the mass killing of minorities, of Christians and, uh, and others, which had not really happened in earlier times. Now, the Ottomans had been ruling those areas for 400 years at that point, what had suddenly changed. And I want to emphasize a point which is going to sound um, maybe strange, maybe counterintuitive, but it might be the most important thing I have to say, which is if you listen to the rhetoric of the people who carry out mass killings like that, their greatest single justification and reason for doing it is self-defense. They always see themselves as defending themselves 
against external assault. And that can seem ludicrous. Why on earth would people suddenly strike at a minority, kill thousands, hundreds of thousands of people um, on the basis of, of self-defense? What, what uh, harm can these women and children do? And I have to be so careful here because what I do not want to do is to try and explain what the Ottoman authorities decided and then seem as if I am justifying what they did. Clearly, I'm not doing uh, such a thing. But look at the world from the point of view of the Ottomans in 1915. Over the previous <coughs> century, their empire had contracted enormously. Once upon a time, they basically ruled from uh, the Straits of Gibraltar uh, to the, uh, the lands that we call Iraq and the Persian border, one of the greatest empires in history. They ruled the uh, southeastern quadrant of Europe. And by 1915, they were reduced to a <coughs> relatively small Middle Eastern territory, Turkey, Syria, um, uh, uh, neighboring lands. And what had happened was they had suffered repeated uh, defeats, conquests, and mass ethnic expulsions of Muslims. By 1915, there were only three Muslim states left in the world. There was the Ottoman Empire, there was Persia, and there was Afghanistan, which was sort of only tenuously uh, a state. The Ottomans also knew something very strongly, which was they knew that the surrounding uh, Christian powers all had their own designs on how they wanted to carve up the Ottoman world. And the only thing that was uh, preventing that carve up, which logically should have happened in the 1850s and 1860s, was uh, that the, the three main powers, Britain, France, and Russia, could not decide on who got the spoils. In other words, well, the Russians wanted it. The Russians, uh, in 1914, were reading all these messianic prophecies uh, about how a new Constantine was going to arise and he would uh, rule in Constantinople and suppress the Muslims. And the, uh, the Russians had had this on their agenda for many years. And the one thing the, Russian, uh, the British and French did not want was the, uh, the Russians in a warm water port. And so as long as you had that balance of terror, the Ottomans were safe. In 1914, the British and the French and the Russians went to war on the same side, and any sane person knew that the Ottoman Empire was not going to last the war. What did that mean for the uh, Ottomans? It meant that after the war, very, very likely, their country was going to be partitioned. It meant that they were probably going to be colonized like uh, Algeria, and the justification for this was that you had these Christian minorities scattered throughout the country. When the Turks acted as they did in a way for which there was no justification, moral, legal, any other kind, from their point of view in 1914, uh, in 1915, they were acting in what they saw as self-defense. It's very interesting. The, the day uh, that is usually marked as the beginning of the genocide is April 24th, which also marks the day that British forces landed at Gallipoli. And the Russians are pressing here, the British are pressing here. Um, I, I think that, uh, that helps explain it. And the other thing I would uh, point out is if you look at the people who actually carried out the killings, the Ottoman Empire is a very, very diverse area the commonest reason why people undertook those killings of Christians was not that they were Muslims, but that they were Muslims who had been expelled from some other place. Of the three men who formed the junta ruling the Ottoman Empire in 1915, uh, uh, Jalal, Talat, uh, and uh, Enver, all of them were from areas which used to be Muslim, but where the Muslims had been expelled. They were all refugees. None of them could go home again. If you look at the death squads 
the people who carried out some of the worst of the killings, they were very often what we call Circassians, who were Muslims from the Caucasus, who the Russians had expelled in hundreds of thousands in the 1860s and um, 1870s. If you hear me at any point seeming to justify anything that went on, you'd be totally wrong. But what I'm saying is we can understand something of why they made this appalling decision in a way that might help us understand other instances. Um, the, the other point I would make, and this does speak to issues of, uh, of policy, is there's a very common pattern that goes through the, um, through the 19th century like this. Um, you would have a, uh, an outbreak of religious ethnic violence against Christians in the Ottoman Empire. Western countries would come in, they would use that as an excuse to extend their power over some bit of the Ottoman Empire, and then Ottoman people, Turkish people, the Turkish government would respond by new persecutions which provoked new interventions. So you have almost a feedback loop. You know, the, uh, one classic example of that happens in uh, 1860 when uh, Christians are being killed in large numbers in Syria and uh, Damascus. Um, the French use that as an excuse basically to establish a protectorate of what later becomes their, um, their territory of, uh, of Lebanon. The only person who is a, uh, a hero in that story, by the way, and this gets to the issue of uh, religion, is a man called Abdul Qader, who had been the great leader of the Muslim Jihad against the French in Algeria. The French had captured him, they'd exiled him to Damascus, and in the actual massacres, uh, he saved many thousands of Christians and Catholics. Uh, and he became actually a, a global hero for that. Um, Abram Lincoln sent him presents. Uh, different countries gave him different uh, medals. And what, what, the British, of course, what else would they give him? An engraved shotgun. What, what, what else do you, uh, do you give people? But when we look at the idea of this being a religious war, it does help to remember that, you know, there are lots of, um, there are lots of exceptions uh, like this. Was the, uh, was the Armenian genocide a religious struggle? You know, I can go back and forth on this. I can present both cases of this. I can make the argument that it was one of a series of episodes dating back to the late 19th century in which Muslim forces, Muslim communities, Muslim clergy were very heavily involved. The most dangerous day for Christian communities was always Friday when crowds would come out of mosques after the Friday prayers and uh, they would cry Allahu Akbar and attack the local uh, Christian uh, community. Some of the leaders of the Ottoman state had or developed impeccable religious credentials. Uh, Enver Pasha, who is the, uh, one of the leaders of the junta, uh, after the war, he, um, he, he actually became almost a um, sort of a jihadi superstar. He went off to join a, a Muslim jihad in Central Asia, and he died fighting in Tajikistan against Bolshevik forces, supposedly with a sword in one hand and the Quran in the other. So you can certainly point to people who have this very strong Muslim uh, justification. I would also say that if you look at the regime at the time, it is much less inspired by Islam than by radical, modernizing nationalism. I would see them as akin more to like the, the Bolsheviks in Russia than to uh, ISIS. I don't neglect or ignore the Islamic uh, issue, but do not, do not see that as purely a jihad. I would see the, uh, the ideology, whether it's nationalism, whether it's uh, jihad, as a dressing for fundamental interests of state, interests of a threatened ruling class striking back against people 
that they wanted to destroy. And the way in which they understand that, they do so in a new scientific terms. Around the world at that point in 1914, 1915, in America, in Britain, in Russia, people are reconceiving the uh, state in biological terms. The state is a biological organism. You as an individual are a cell in that larger organism. The Ottomans take aboard that idea and if you look at their rhetoric about the Armenians and the Christians, they don't usually express it in terms of the Quran. They express it in the language of modern science. If I have a tumor in my body, I have a right, a duty as a doctor to cut it out. They use that medical organic language. And that is why I tend to underplay the, uh, the religious element. Um, you know, you can find plenty of stories of Muslim communities helping Christians and so on. But uh, do, do not rank them with um, ISIS for better or worse in terms of their motives. I, I would see the, the Ottoman uh, act of genocide as a product of a, a radical, modernizing, nationalist regime desperate to save what it sees as a, um, a country under threat. And I would also say that I think we have a couple of maybe analytical tools there that help us to understand later acts of persecution and, uh, and violence. Uh, maybe you have exceptions to this rule, but I don't think any group has ever got up one day and said, let's go attack those people we've always been on good terms with. There is always, if you like, a spiral. And the commonest reason why people believe they need to carry out this kind of attack is that of self-defense. And I, I look, for instance, we've, uh, we've heard a lot uh, today from Nini Shea um, about Iraq. And I, I suppose many people in the West tend to think of this in terms of, uh, of religion. You have these uh, religious extremists, these uh, you know, disgusting beings like ISIS. But let's look at some numbers. Remember I used the phrase, a threatened ruling elite. Look at Iraq. For many years, the ruling uh, elites in Iraq were Sunni Arabs. And I stress those two things because there are plenty of uh, Sunni Muslims in Iraq who are, not, um, who are not Arab. The Kurds, for instance, are mainly Sunni Muslims. So if you carve out, if you take out the Shia, you take out the Kurds, then what you're left with is one-sixth of the population of Iraq, six million out of 36 million, is the Sunni Arabs who had been ruling the roost basically over the past 60 or 70 years. And suddenly, following the US invasion, they found themselves facing the position of minority status. Now, you know, if you've been a threatened minority, a persecuted minority for centuries, Maybe you get used to it, maybe not. But if you've always been the ruling race, the ruling elite, you decide where favors go, where contracts go, who controls the police, who controls the government, and suddenly you're told, well, I'm afraid you don't have that anymore, you are going to strike back very forcefully. And when you look at ISIS, do not look at it just in terms of Islam, Look at it in terms of one particular version of Islam linked to those tribal um, um, allegiances. It's also significant, of course, that the, uh, the bloodiest atrocities of all are those connected with, who did I mention earlier? Exiles, refugees, people who've left, been expelled from uh, one particular region, one particular country, and their attitude tends to be, we've moved once, we're not moving further, th this far and no further. One of the characteristics of Iraq over the past decade has been the mass expulsion of communities, Sunni and Shia areas, Shia and Sunni um, areas. And of course, then you get these international brigades of uh, fanatics from Europe and the West who have zero 
interest in any of the old social relations, social ties which used to preserve harmony within these communities. And suddenly you look at the um, Armenian genocide and something like ISIS is on a totally different scale, but it's following so many of those same basic rules. You know, uh, we just mentioned this very briefly as an example of a genocide in which religion plays some role. We talked about Rwanda, um, where if you uh, remember, the, uh, the Hutu of Rwanda kill 800,000 of the minority people called the Tutsi. And you think, why on earth would they suddenly do that? And then you look back at the country next door, where 20 years earlier, the Tutsi had tried to exterminate the Hutu. And you had these um, hundreds of thousands of refugees who moved into uh, Rwanda. And the view was, well, I, I don't want to say this again, but we've been kicked out once. We're not going any further. And I, I, I think we actually do see some uh, general kind of applicable, um, applicable rules there. Um, and th th this is why I'm nervous when people present something like this solely in religious terms. If it is Sunni Islam that makes groups like ISIS so abhorrent in their behavior, then it's also worth pointing out that Sunni Islam is the faith of the Kurds, who are basically the West's allies and foot soldiers in the area. This is not simply a religious uh, struggle in that uh, sense. Oh, I entirely, by the way, underline uh, what Nina Shea said um, about using that excellent uh, piece in The Atlantic about the religious foundations of ISIS. Uh, a very, very good, uh, very good piece. Was it a religious event? Yes, in the sense that the targets were virtually all uh, uh, a Christian. You know, the Ottoman regime had always been corrupt and oppressive, but at this point they became homicidal. They killed Christians. They did not kill Muslims. It's, it's a religious persecution in that, uh, in that sense. What I would also like uh, to do is to try and step back and look at this from the point of view of how we understand these campaigns in religious terms from the point of view of the, the Christians. What are the, uh, what are the implications uh, uh, there? And partly, um, they're, they're very practical. Um, I, I wrote a book called Lost History of Christianity, which looked at how Christians had survived basically under Muslim rule for, oh, maybe from the 14th century through the, uh, through the 20th. And uh, I, I made a, a number of interesting um, finds uh, there, but one of the, um, uh, the most important was if you look around the world in, say, 1000 AD, there are huge Christian communities in the Middle East, in Asia, in uh, Egypt, even in uh, China, and also in Europe. Basically, they're wiped out in most of the world in the 14th century, except in Europe. What is the variable that means that Europe survives and other places uh, don't? It's very simple. If and when Christians have states to rely on, they will survive. If they don't, they don't. And if you think about it, that's uh, almost a shocking thing to say in a Baptist university which does not believe in the alliance of church and state. Historically, I would say that without Christian states, and I'm talking through the Middle Ages, not in the modern era, Christianity does not and did not survive. And uh, it, it is, as I say, um, an interesting uh, thought in, um, in modern times when we are talking about the survival of Christian communities in areas of Syria and Iraq, and incidentally I'd put the Christian population in Syria somewhat uh, higher than has been uh, described, and you can only talk about it in terms of alliance with states and in terms of the number of airstrikes, which is a, an, alarming, uh, an alarming statement. I'm not saying that it is in any sense uh, wrong 
Um, but it, 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 it uh, does raise interesting questions about the, uh, the nature of, um, of Christian um, survival. Oh, the other thing, by the way, about how Christians had survived through those long centuries. I, um, I got to be quite good at uh, geography and maps. And I, uh, I, I, I looked at all the Christian communities in, um, in the Middle East and uh, North Africa. And I, uh, I found one thing, which is they have uh, two things in common. Either, basically, they live in desolate areas. They live in areas that other people don't want. And if you draw the 2,000-foot contour around the Middle East, and you look above that, that's where you'll find the Christian areas. There's, a, um, th 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 there's uh, supposedly an old... Um, uh, there's no Jewish uh, story where a man is uh, asking uh, a, a, a rabbi, uh, is there a blessing for the Tsar? And uh, this was at a time when there was you know, terrible persecution of Jews by the Tsarist authorities. And he said, certainly there is. God keep the Tsar far away from us. <laughs> you look at places where the mainstream authority does not want, and that's where you have the Christian communities. Now move forward into the 20th century, the age of railroads and roads and new concepts of the state, of conscription, military draft, of, um, of taxes, of ideals of mass public education, where you have a state that is trying to reach out into all those areas, and that is when minorities come under the greatest threat not just in the Middle East. Once again, it's not just a question of Islam and Christianity, it's the problem of every uh, minority community um, around, the, uh, around the world. So that's maybe um, a practical comment. Here's a, uh, a theological thought. In 1915, some of, 15, 16, some of the world's oldest Christian communities were uprooted and destroyed. Uh, and, you know, in some ways, um, unless you know something about the early history of the church, you miss so much. Um, you know, one of the great capitals of ISIS is a city called Raqqa in Syria, uh, a, a great uh, center of the Christianity of Syria in the fourth and fifth centuries, a great Greco-Roman um, center. There are these very, very deep roots. Christianity survives for centuries, survives for millennia, and is rooted out. How do Christians try and explain that? How do Christians try and explain the idea that places where Christians were once at their absolute strongest cease to, uh, cease to exist? If you were to look at a map of the Christian world in 1000 AD and you mapped the great centers of the church, you would certainly begin with places like Iraq. You would begin with places like Syria. You would begin with areas of the Middle East. You would generously expand over to Europe, but not, not with much enthusiasm. How do you explain that? Christ told his followers to go and make uh, disciples of all nations. What happens when Christians make disciples of a nation and that nation is then destroyed? How do we explain that? How do we try and understand that? At the time, the commonest theory for the destruction of Christian communities is a very Old Testament idea. It goes from the understanding that we as Christians have sinned so badly, so horribly, that God is punishing us. In the um, 1140s, for example, the, uh, the Turks sacked the great Christian city of Edessa. And one of the great scholars of the day was a man called Michael the Syrian. And he said, uh, uh, quote, the city of Abjar, the friend of Christ, was trampled underfoot because of our iniquities. Some aged priests recited the words of the prophet, I will endure the Lord's wrath because I have sinned against him and angered him. And they did not take flight, nor did they cease praying until the sword rendered them mute. Why is this ancient church, this ancient Christian community being destroyed? We failed, we sinned, 
and whoever is doing it, whatever their religious perspectives, um, they were doing God's will. Clearly, before anyone protests, I think that's an absolutely unacceptable idea. But it's probably the commonest idea for many, uh, many centuries. You know, um, in the 1220s, there was a great Syriac author called Solomon of Basra, and he wrote about the Muslim victories of the Middle East and how they'd conquered all the Christian territories. And he wrote it in the form of a, a retroactive prophecy. Then shall the fat ones of the kingdom of the Greeks be destroyed by Ishmael, the wild ass of the desert. Uh, it shall be a merciless chastisement. It is not because God loves them that he's allowed them to enter into the kingdom of the Christians, but by reason of the iniquity and sin which is wrought by the Christians, the like of which has never been wrought in any one of the former generations. Well, apart from being, as I say, an unacceptable idea in many ways, it's very hard to look at any church of the Middle East and see that it was particularly worse or more sinful than, uh, than any other. Would anyone dare, has anyone dared come up with an explanation like that for the Armenian Genocide? I, um, I doubt it. But we have a, um, we have a basic uh, problem here, which is what seems to be the fundamental mystery, the fundamental dilemma of God's silence in the face of the destruction of his servants. When a great Christian city like Diyarbakir, had its Christians slaughtered in 1915. Why did an angel with a sword not stand in the way of the persecutors? Why were the persecutors not, not destroyed? You know, there's a, uh, there's a book I love that tries to address this centrally. And it's by one of the greatest uh, Christian novelists of all time, uh, a Japanese writer called Shusaku Endo great uh, Catholic author of the late 20th century. And he was uh, writing about a situation very much like the Armenian Genocide. He wrote about the destruction of Japanese Christianity in the 17th century. Probably 100,000, 200,000 Japanese Christians were destroyed. And he wrote a novel called Silence, which is based on the experience of the last priest in this community who wanders the landscape and he sees around him the, uh, the, the blood of the victims and the gallows and the tortures and everywhere where Christianity has been destroyed. And he says this, the black soil of Japan has been filled with the lament of so many Christians. The red blood of priests has flowed profusely. The walls of the churches have fallen down. And in the face of this terrible and merciless sacrifice, offered up to him. God has remained silent. And the whole book is about the theological agony of this one priest. And he begins by thinking, well, you know, perhaps our church has sinned dreadfully. No, no, that, that can't be it. How, how on earth can, uh, can you explain this? Um, be aware, uh, in a, within the next year, Martin Scorsese is producing a film of silence when this is going to be very much discussed. And I'll be very interested to see how the film tackles the very serious, very critical theological uh, views there. How do you deal with the extermination of a church? The black soil of Armenia has been filled with the lament of so many Christians. Do I have an answer to this dilemma? Well, I'm going to offer you a couple and you, uh, you can see what you think. The first one is how do you deal with the eternal, absolute destruction and disappearance of a church? And the first thing I'd reply is there's no such thing. In human time frames, churches disappear. Human time frames are not God's time frames. I give you as an example the story of the church in China where one of my little hobbies as a historian is collecting quotes about the eternal and absolute destruction of the church in China. They come around every couple of hundred years before the church rises stronger than it had been before. The church has entered China on five separate occasions, 
On each occasion, it has been utterly destroyed, never to rise again. And two or three hundred years, it's been back stronger than ever. In the uh, 18th century, it was destroyed absolutely, never to rise again. It returned in much larger force with the missionary movement of the 19th century. In 1949, the communist revolution utterly destroyed the church in China forever, never to rise again. And today, there are far, far more Christians in China than in any European nation, and far more Christians than there ever were in Chinese history. If you want to say something is eternal or forever, I would just like to say, how do you know? When I was, uh, uh, when I was young, one of my uh, all-time favorite um, music albums was uh, by a, uh, a West Coast group by the name of Love, and the uh, album was called Forever Changes. And that, for me, is a great motto for Christian history. But this is true forever. Yeah, well, forever changes. The other thing I would say is, you know, we, we, all, we all tend to do this. We all tend to say, as, as Nina Shea said this morning, and I said in the past, I'm certainly not criticizing her, that um, the Christianity of Syria or Iraq might be absolutely destroyed. Well, come back in 200 years and let's talk about it. Um, Christianity uh, seems to be on the verge of being uprooted in Iraq, just like it was on China on five separate occasions. But there are astonishing centers of growth around the Muslim world, mainly in the Arab Gulf, in countries like the United Arab uh, Emirates, in Dubai, in, uh, in Kuwait. As Nina Shea mentioned, they're trying to pass a law prohibiting the building of new churches in the Arabian Peninsula. Why do they need to do that unless people are building new churches in the Arabian Peninsula? And the answer is they're bringing in these uh, immigrant communities from countries like the Philippines to do uh, manual work and accidentally finding themselves with Christian communities in these countries, which were already 7 to 10% of the population. Saudi Arabia is a 100% Muslim country, uh, as strict, irrational, rigid as you can possibly get. No other religion is allowed. If four or five of us gathered in a room for a cup of coffee, it's quite likely that the religious police would knock down the door and want to make sure we weren't having Christian prayers. The Christian population of Saudi Arabia is five to seven percent. Don't tell me that churches are entirely destroyed in the, um, in the Middle East. They come back in different ways. They also tend to come back as ghosts. If you ever read the history of Christianity, if you ever read the Christianity around the world outside Europe, you come to believe very strongly in ghosts. Not Halloween ghosts, but ghosts in the form of other movements, other religions, other communities that we tend, uh, we, we tend not, to, uh, not to think of. Um, I hope to live long enough to see histories of Islam take full account of what most scholars know about the enormous contributions of older Christian churches to Islam. If you want to write such a book right now, do it under a pseudonym. I mean it. Uh, so you have a scholar like uh, uh, Christoph Luxemburg. Uh, I certainly don't agree with on, uh, on everything before Dr. Baku uh, 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 attacks me on this. Um, but he, he makes wonderful points about the uh, role of older Syriac uh, readings in the, um, uh, uh, in, uh, in the Quran. If you look at a lot of um, Islamic practice, you see these kind of survivals, you see these kind of, um, of ghosts. Also, Christianity is a very unusual religion in the sense of being, let me explain this as I say it, it is a religion without a heart. Let me explain. What I mean is it doesn't have a geographical heart. There is, Islam has a heart. 
Islam has a heart in the Arabian Peninsula, those lands in the, uh, the ancient uh, Middle East. It spreads, maybe it loses some of those outer extensions, but it always retains its heart. Christianity has no heart. It's founded in Palestine and Syria. Um, possibly Christianity will be destroyed in those countries, but Christianity grows around the world in corners where nobody, no rational person, <coughs> expects. And, uh, you know, I, I have to be very careful um, about this. The Armenian Genocide is an absolute horror. Nothing can excuse or help us understand the incredible sufferings of individual people. But, you know, two interesting things happened in 1915. One form of Christianity was being stamped out in the lands that we now call Turkey, and a whole new Christianity was being born in, lands called, uh, in the lands of Africa. And that happens precisely almost within the month that the, uh, uh, of the um, Armenian Genocide. If you look at the fate of um, individuals, the fate is catastrophic. If you look at the church and the world and of, um, of Christianity, where, where one ancient portal is slamming shut, another very spectacular one is swinging open. In 1900, there were 10 million Christians in Africa. By 2000, there were 360 million Christians in Africa. By about 2050, there will be 1 billion Christians in Africa, and it will be the centerpiece of the Christian story. If you want to tell me that individuals and families and communities suffered horribly in Armenia in 1915, you are absolutely right, and nothing can cast a brighter light on that. If you want to tell me the church died in 1915, you're totally wrong. And it's very hard for us as scholars, as Christians, as thinkers, to think in these very large global terms, in these terms of, um, in, in, in these uh, terms of uh, centuries. This is one of the quotes I, um, I wanted. Um, when, I, uh, when I wrote my um, lost history, I included some uh, kind of remarks uh, which were almost intended to be cynical. I was using some of the hymns that suggested that, you know, God guided all things in the world, and I would say, oh, there was this terrible massacre, and how do we reconcile this? And then you look at it, and then you look at kind of the long-term fate of some of these areas and some of these churches, and you think, well, maybe, um, oh, come thou wisdom from on high, who orderest all things mightily. Well, maybe. Uh, I mentioned uh, Japan, for example. Japanese Christianity was uh, uh, absolutely destroyed, never to uh, rise again. Do you know how many Japan, a country which is one of the least successful grounds for uh, Christianity. Does anyone know how many Christian prime ministers Japan has had in the last century? Eight. Do you know how Bo many Buddhist presidents the United States has had in the last century? Roughly less than one. Um, a small minority, but an extremely powerful minority, uh, they, they control absolutely nothing in Japan uh, except for a large chunk of the government and the university that educates most of the ruling class. That's not bad. I would ask you uh, two things, really. One is, please don't hear me saying that I'm trying to understand or excuse any act of genocide or persecution. Clearly, I'm not. Please don't hear me as saying, well, something terrible happened there, but it all comes good in the long run. Of course it doesn't. Of course it doesn't for those, um, for those individuals. But you know, I was so pleased Dr. Shea put up uh, that picture today of the martyrs. If your whole Christian view of the world is in terms of it'll all come right, uh, right in the afterlife, it's a very flawed system. But all Christians from the beginning have taken that other dimension, that afterlife dimension, 
very seriously. And I hope all Christians believe that those 21 Egyptian Copts are now in glory. And that is a, uh, if, if you like, a, um, a fundamental uh, tenet, of, uh, tenet of faith. So um, what, what I, would, I suppose I would uh, like to say, we look at something like the, uh, the Armenian uh, genocide. We can think of all sorts of ways of um, intervening, of uh, trying to prevent it, uh, of avoiding the great danger that uh, it, it will generate, um, our intervention will generate uh, worse ills. But ultimately what we should not do is say it is all about God's silence. I think there are two kinds of silence. There's a silence where nobody's speaking and there's a silence where somebody's speaking and nobody's listening. And I would suggest that maybe that is the kind of silence you have in this uh, story. So uh, what, can, uh, what can we do? Well, you know, would I, would I be uh, would I be sad to see many, many uh, uh, Allied aircraft uh, wreaking harm on ISIS? No, I, um, I would not. But the most important thing maybe is what Christians have always done, which is in remembering. In remembering, in commemorating, in passing on the story. What's the word for passing on? Tradition, okay? And if there's a, uh, there's a line I would, uh, I, I, I would use, there's a wonderful poet called uh, Charles uh, Olson, and he, uh, he has a, uh, a poem which is, the chain of memory is resurrection. In other words, memory and resurrection and bringing from the dead are very closely related activities. That's a million miles away from the realm of trying to prevent future atrocities, or maybe it isn't. Because the more you remember, the more you understand, the more you understand what's at stake. No community is dead as long as people still talk about it. So maybe that would be my, my motto for trying to understand these horrors. The chain of memory is resurrection. And I will wind up at that point. I will say thank you very much. And I will open to any questions that anyone might have. Thank you. Please. Thank you, Philip. Um, you uh, mentioned the uh, connection between uh, 1915's genocide and Gallipoli. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody who's ever been in Australia, New Zealand at this time of year, the Anzac holiday, mm -hmm. knows how the, the, this is just a, an iconic time. Mm -hmm. uh, can you say something, or, or maybe someone else in the room can say something about finding ways to link uh, Anzac Day celebrations and the Gallipoli commemorations to the Armenian genocide? I, I know that's problematized by Mustafa Kemal's role there deliberately, and now his subsequent taking the lead in leading denial. Yeah. But is there, do you know of anything in Australia and New Zealand to try to find ways to link? To the best of my knowledge, and uh, Peter may well have uh, uh, comments on this, uh, in Australian memory they are not linked in the slightest. Nobody uh, puts the two uh, uh, together. Um, and, uh, you know, clearly that, that's a shame because one of the things where you learn when you look at something like the First World War is how everything is very closely uh, uh, interrelated in that way. Um, in fact, when, when historians look at the Gallipoli campaign, um, they are absolutely baffled to this day as to why it happened where it did. And it's a great example that if people knew more about the religious scene and the religious map, they wouldn't have done it like that. Because what uh, Churchill had in mind was this very 
hard-pushing uh, campaign to try and seize the Straits, seize Constantinople. Great idea, um, provided the Turks don't have superb defenses. There is a whole undefended um, area of the coast east of there around the city that's known as Alexandretta at the time, which is around uh, Antakya and uh, uh, th that, uh, that area, where if they'd landed, A, they would have had a completely uh, undefended, uh, unopposed landing, but they would have been able to link up with sympathetic Armenian and Assyrian people who would have welcomed them and flocked to their colors as they already had around Lake Van uh, in the north. And it's one of the great mysteries of uh, uh, World War I history. What on earth was Churchill thinking of? And it uh, took him 25 years to uh, uh, overcome the simple question of why didn't you do Alexandretta? And if they'd thought more about these minority communities, they, uh, uh, they, they could probably have uh, uh, won. But my sense of the link between the two is that there's, uh, there's none. Can I, can I turn to uh, uh, Peter to know if he, uh, does he have any comments yeah, on that? I'll just reflect on it uh, for a moment by noting that uh, in the past few months, the Turkish government has tried, you may have been reading this in the press if you follow this history, the Turkish government has been trying to create a counter Armenian Genocide Memorial on April 24 by calling nations to Gallipoli on that day. Mm. It's been received with anger from most heads of state. You know, they, they're really disgusted with Davidoglu and Erdogan for trying such a underhanded tactic to try to distract heads of state and world consciousness from the big commemoration of the Armenian genocide that will happen around the world, but especially in Yerevan, in the capital of Armenia. So the Liberty has been, you know, it's being manipulated now by Turkey in this way. And, and the good news is that it's, it's, it's kind of failing, and I think the Turkish government is going to perhaps redate this event now changing it to late March or something. We'll wait to see how that goes out. But um, having gone to Australia to do lectures on this subject, I, I noticed, and I was there at Anzac Day actually, and I noticed that uh, the Turkish government appeals deeply to New Zealand and Australia to join them in this uh, military commemoration. But that, it, but that the Australian community is now more and more disaffected and divided by this because of the Armenian genocide issue. And so it's playing out, I don't know about New Zealand, but in Australia it's sort of playing out in a, in a bifurcated way and that Armenian memory has come to complicate the more simplistic nationalism of Anzac there. It's actually a really good subject for a good essay mm -hmm. on, on memory and complexity of nationalisms and identities. By the way, two, two comments, just very quick about Anzac Day. Uh, at Gallipoli and in the campaign, there were far more British and French soldiers than there were Australians and New Zealanders, but it's been taken over as a, a, an Australian thing. The other thing that's changed in Australia is you have these days so many uh, new Australians who are descendants of Middle Eastern minority communities. So there's Armenians, there's Assyrians in large numbers. And the other interesting one, whenever you get the list of the languages spoken in Australia, it's, it's always quite funny. Number one is English, number two is Italian, number three is Lebanese, and number eight is Arabic. If anyone knows the difference between Lebanese and Arabic, put your hands up right now. But uh, what, what's happened is uh, so many Christian Lebanese have gone to Austra uh, Australia and they're not going to call their language Arabic. Um, but there's a lot of Middle East Christians in, um, in uh, Australia and that really complicates anything about the Armenian Genocide. It's, it, it, it's a classic example. 
of uh, the, uh, the, the use and, um, and abuse of uh, history. You know, I'm just thinking of one thing again relating to the, uh, uh, the commemoration issue. Um, the great novel of the Armenian Genocide is uh, Verfel's uh, 40 Days at uh, Musadakh, which is from, what, 1933? You have the year wrong. You could write a great book on the efforts in Hollywood and around the world to make a film of that low these past 80 years and why there isn't a film of 40 Days at Musadakh. Because all the way through, um, Turkish authorities would intervene in the 30s and the 50s and prevent it being made. Uh, so, whereas, what do we think of Gallipoli? You know the 1981 film? Everyone knows Gallipoli. Have you ever seen the great epic of the 40 days of Musadak? No, you haven't. Films can be made or, uh, or not made. So, yeah. Can I have one quick follow-up? Yeah. So, uh, I think there was an idea that Churchill had to maybe involve three partisans I didn't say that. No, if you oh. could speak to that. The oh, okay, Greek Christians. Of Christians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Compared to you know, I, I, I have a real problem there. Um, what, what happens with the Greeks is that at least in the early stages of the war, they are not treated anything like the Armenians or the Assyrians. They are they're persecuted, they're discriminated against. In some cases, uh, you'll get uh, people who are arrested and so on. It's absolutely the different uh, scale from what happens uh, at the end of the war. It's at the end of the war, when the Greeks invade and occupy Turkey, that you get a full-scale uh, ethnic war um, breaking out. It's partly because the Greeks are so important in cities like Smyrna and in Constantinople that persecuting them is just not an option. Um, you know, it, it, it's, um, it, it's like saying that we're going to uh, try and run New York City and uh, persecute, uh, persecute all the Catholics. Good luck. Um, there are 400,000 Greeks in Constantinople at this point. Uh, it, um, it just can't be done. Whereas there are areas around the country, like uh, Diyarbakir, where um, Armenians and Assyrians are so concentrated uh, away from the city that you can launch a military, uh, a military campaign. But once the, once the option arises during war, they do strike at them very, uh, very ferociously, and you get the mass uh, population transfer. Um, so the, the, the Greeks are just uh, are very different. There's also one other element, which is Russian policy, because the Russians had spent the previous hundred years cultivating the Armenians as their special proxy forces in the Ottoman Empire, and they hadn't done the same thing to anything like the same extent with the Greeks. So when the, the Ottomans look at, uh, at the Armenians, they're basically saying, you know, you may seem very nice, but you're going to rise and join the Russians any day. So it, it, it's a different policy in, uh, in that way, which is another reason why I say it's wrong to see this just as a religious war, because it's those Christians, not these Christians, and incidentally, not Jews, who uh, do not, uh, uh, are not persecuted. But, uh, it's a complicated and horrible story. Anyone else? You mean I said nothing controversial enough? I'm going to start again. I'm, I'm, you know, I've got to realize my, my courage in standing here because I mentioned something about Syriac with Dr. Baku there. I mentioned something about uh, poetry with Dr. Russell here. I'm, I'm a very brave individual to do this sort of thing. Um, yeah, I know, I know. That's true. Okay, well, if there are uh, no questions, I will um, call a halt there. And I believe that we have uh, refreshments downstairs. Yes, in the reception hall. All right. So uh, from me, two cookies. There you go. <laughs>